This is the tale of Boaz. <clears throat> and Joe likes, Joe likes to talk about um, stories of coincidence or shared joy. Um, and this is that, but this is really a love story. Um, the coincidence in this story is that it started a, a number of years ago. My wife, Jill, was shopping, and she bumped into a woman from our church in, while she was shopping. And the woman said that they had a dog that they were going to get rid of. They couldn't keep this dog anymore. Um, and did Jill know anybody who would like this dog? Now, this was a, a Springer Spaniel, <clears throat> young Springer Spaniel. The, the couple who was giving it away had rescued it from a family who initially had, had mistreated it, you know, the, the, the collars with the studs on the inside and the short leashes. And it really mistreated this, this dog at a very young age. And then this family took the dog in when it was about three months old. And um, they were both school teachers. So they kept this spaniel locked up in a garage while they were teaching all day. When they come home, there was so much energy in this dog that it would just run around and would, they, it would leap their stockade fence, you know, the six foot stockade fence, and run around. And, and the last thing I think you want to do after trying to, to you know, take care of children all day is to try to f catch a, a wild dog at night. And so <clears throat> after about six months, they had had enough. And so they were going to get rid of this dog. So Jill said, you know, go, go check. Check on this dog. And I said, as a dutiful husband, loving husband I am, I said, yes, dear, knowing in my head that there was no way on God's green earth that I was going to come home with a dog because we had just had our third child in four years. Our house was about the size of a postage stamp, and there was no room in that place for any other living, breathing creature. But... I was a good husband. I said I would go after work. <clears throat> and I remember parking. I remember walking up to the door of that house. And I remember opening the outside door to get to the screen door. And then, and then there was that moment when I looked through that door. And looking up at me on the other side of that door was that, that dog and our eyes locked, and it was, like, it was like birds imprinting on each other. And I don't remember anything else from that evening. I don't remember talking to the people. All I knew was that I had me a dog. <laughs> well, that dog and I became inseparable. Now, the first thing we had to do was we had to come up with a name for this dog because the people there had named him Goofy. And that just wasn't going to do. A dog needs, like a kid, needs a good name. In order to grow strong, they need a good name. And so we turn to that repository of great names, <clears throat> the Bible. And we started paging through. Where are we going to find a name for this dog? And we tried on a few ones, you know. We tried on Zedekiah. Ah, not quite good. Zerubbabel. <laughs> Zerubbabel. I mean, all good names, but, you know, not, not all that good. And then finally, Jill stumbled across the name Boaz. Boaz. Well, there's a name, got a, just a hint of royalty to it, dignity in there that every spaniel needs, a hint of dignity. And, uh, you know, called well, called so well, in fact, that sometimes I called my children that, but to their dismay and the dog's dismay, <laughs> actually. And so we named him Boaz. And the, the interesting little caveat here is that um, <clears throat> I have an older brother who lives in Georgia, and we don't talk, we love each other, but we don't talk to each other. So I called him about a month after we got the dog. And I said, yep, we got a dog. What kind? He's a Springer Spaniel. Oh, yeah, we got one of those. He says to me over the phone, he says, what did you name him? I said, we named him Boaz. Silence on the other end of the phone. And then finally my brother says in a whisper, that's the name of my dog. <laughs> so I think we chose well. Now, Boaz, when, when he came to live with us, was good. But I think the day that I took him up to Camp Fowler to, to go to work was, I think, the day that Boaz truthfully and factfully, maybe more, more truthfully than factually, died and went to heaven. This dog was now a camp dog, the camp dog. And that's a noble position for any dog. He never, he never was out of my sight. He was always around, but he was the 
omnipresent presence at the camp. And we'd be walking along and kids would be running down from the chapel or running up from the beach and they'd go, Boaz, 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 and they'd scratch him every which way but loose. I, I swear that for about, for a number of years, I wasn't even sure the campers knew that I was there. Because they would go with that and then, and then every now and then one kid would look up and say, Oh, oh, hi, Uncle Kent. And they go back to petting the dog. Well, that's a noble position for a dog to be in. And it's hard being a camp dog. You got There's some rules you have to live by. Um, you always got to be nice. That was easy for, for Boaz. But, but one of the rules he didn't understand was he had to stay out of the dining hall. And for two straight years, <clears throat> I'd go into the dining hall. The dog would sneak in. I'd grab him by the collar, and I was the only one who could ever do that. Grab him by the collar, drag him outside of the door, set him down, and go back in. And we fought that battle for two years until we reached a compromise. We reached a truce that he, I would let him lay in the doorway of the dining hall, and he would stick his nose up over the threshold of the door and lie there with those sad eyes and those droopy curly ears looking at the campers and the campers would all look at me and go, you're so mean. You don't treat that dog well. And Boaz would just love it. And so he would stay out of the dining hall until we'd all leave and then every now and then he'd still sneak in and try to grab some things that might be lying around in the compost bucket and I'd drag him back out. But he was a busy dog at camp. Um, there were lots of things to do. There were lots of canoe rides to go on, and he'd always jump up in the front of the canoe. He loved a canoe, and he'd stand up in the bow, and he'd be sort of like this, this mangy bow maid, sort of barking at the water as the canoes would, would go over Sackandaga Lake. Or, or he would often go with me on the van rides, and we'd go to drop kids off to their, their day hikes or pick them up, and he loved that. And the kids usually loved that, unless he'd been down on the beach and just rolled in a dead fish. And then he'd come sit in the van, and then the kids were less excited about having, <laughs> having Boaz sit with them. But he didn't mind at all. He never said a word. And we'd be out, we'd be out all day. We'd be out sometimes 12, 14, 16 hours a day out um, in the camp. And he would never go home without me, never go back to the cabin without me. And so he'd often come back, and he'd be, he'd be really hungry because he hadn't eaten all day. But Boaz was, was so neurotic about not letting me out of his sight. What he would do is he would go to, go to the room and pick up one kibble from his dog dish. And he'd crunch, 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 come into where I was sitting, look at me, make sure I was there, walk back out, pick up one kibble, crunch, 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 crunch and come back around. There were some meals, I swear, he had a you know, negative calorie intake <laughs> because of, he was putting on so many miles to get with me because you see I was his owner but he was my keeper 